Blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. You've been hearing that a lot in the gaming industry. And we are going to talk about something interesting called NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And we have we have uh, Adam Adam Kling here. Here, what? Well, let me let's bring him up. Adam Kling is in the house, um, <laughs> and I, I well, he's going to talk about crypto fights and not and NFTs and why NFTs are just the start of blockchain gaming. That's right. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, is my screen coming? Th okay, cool. Um, yeah, I want to kind of introduce myself uh, first, and then I want to get into. Uh, a lot of the cool stuff, and it's not just NFTs, it's just really the blockchain gaming uh, industry in general because it's so new. But um, I actually, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, been doing a lot of different things, um, but actually started as a computer programmer um, kind of in high school and then into kind of early college and uh, worked for several startups. But I kind of got the bug and wanted to start my own businesses and, um, you know, did anything from like web hosting to uh, software projects. I always wanted to create kind of a project that I could sell as a service and kind of then got into performance marketing and kind of left my programmer hat behind and, and started to wear many different hats. And, uh, you know, essentially be became an entrepreneur where I just wanted to keep creating new things. Um, all the while, you know, I was in a, a very heavy gamer. I, I love video games, been playing video games ever since. Uh, a little bit of Atari, but mostly in uh, uh, Nintendo. I still remember the gyroscope uh, or the robot with the gyroscope that you would place and play the plum plumbing game, I think, back then. So i um, been playing ever since then, uh, heavy in the arcades. Um, and then around 2013, uh, you know, Bitcoin really started making some headlines. I think it was when it hit a billion dollar market cap that I really started to pay attention. And there was uh, some meetup groups actually here in Raleigh that I went and uh, started talking with other people. And it was just this brand new thing that kind of, I, I mean, I think if you started to first get exposed to it about what's possible, just went, uh, I mean, it just went nuts in your mind. So um, started watching it and it was really centered around the currency aspect. It was about how we could send a payment from A to B over the internet. So it was kind of like this magic internet money that um, everyone was talking about. Um, so I couldn't really figure out what to do with it at that point, to be honest. Um, so I, I started doing some other projects not related to uh, blockchain or Bitcoin or any of that. Um, and then it was probably around 2017 where um, I started to kind of look back into it with Ethereum. And uh, that's actually when I started to put the team together to create crypto fights. And crypto fights is, and I'll, I'll talk to, uh, about it more later, but is what really got me involved in video games and blockchain. And so I'm happy to be here uh, at the conference to kind of talk more about it. Um, but first, what I, I want to actually ask the audience, uh, what do you think a blockchain game is? Um, I actually have some uh, some logos of here, some blockchain games here, and if, if maybe anyone recognizes them. Um, it still is a very small uh, niche market compared to uh, mainstream gaming. But I believe it has some incredible opportunity uh, in comparison. It's kind of a, you know, big fish in a little pond versus, you know, little fish in a big pond. So um, if uh, anyone has any idea, I'd love to hear. Um, yeah, and I'm seeing like not too many people are, are coming in with the comments. Nope, Tetris is not a blockchain game. <laughs> I mean, it's something that, that kind of works with kind of a new network, I guess, uh, before I get into it. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and move on while you guys think about that. Um, so one of the, I guess there's, there's several, there's a lot to, to blockchain gaming and I don't want to, I want to keep this very high level, um, because I, again, used to be a programmer and I don't do that now. And I, ha I have engineers that are experts in that, but, um, they, they have some, uh, pretty incredible properties. Um, some of the, I think one of the big concepts to understand is about decentralization. You know, when we typically think about creating games, we're essentially creating a, a game client, you know, something that maybe a person downloads, maybe, you know, even now where people stream the video of a, of a game client, like Stadia, uh, for example. Um, and then it works, you know, with the multiplayer game, it, it's kind of a, a client IO. It, we make moves and then there's a multiplayer server. It updates the state of the game and broadcasts it back out to everyone that's playing, rinse, repeat. And, and that's typically what, at a very simplistic high level view of kind of what's happening. But with blockchain games, we actually have this kind of new network to think about. We have um, the ability to actually put functions out in the blockchain cloud that can do things, 
But in order to get data into it, we have to send a payment into it. And um, I'm going to get into some of the, the nuances of that and with smart contracts and all that. But you can start to think about, well, huh, I can actually put a function or a uh, piece of my game that's out in this kind of cloud that I can't really control after I put it out there. Other people can't take it down. And, and there's some just some really cool things that could happen where they have like decentralized autonomous organizations um, and they have uh, decentralized finance. They have all of these different things called uh, decentralized applications that are forming. And I'm going to get more into that a little bit later. But um, another aspect is that the if when we think about gaming is the items in a game. So all the loot drops, all the all the things that you can equip on your character can actually be tokenized. And what that means is that if you think of Bitcoin or a coin and that coin is just really like, I don't know, worth a penny, let's say. But that coin has some data attached to it. And that data can be your game item. And so if, if that coin can be traded to someone else, that game item can be transferred to someone else too. And that's outside of your game. You have no control over that, essentially. You can only create and mint those into existence. But once it's out, it's out and it's in circulation. So you have some incredible opportunities for economy around your game that don't they, they exist in the traditional sense. I've played a lot of games that do have marketplaces and economies, but they're, they're siloed. They're, you know, they're just in that game and they can't really be taken out. I mean, I even remember like World of Warcraft where you could um, buy gold outside of the game, but to deliver it to you, they, they had to meet you in the game or, or do a mail to, to send that gold over to you. Um, yes, I know I might've been guilty, of that, <laughs> but it was a very interesting thing that happened. They made a lot of money doing that. But with blockchain, you can actually create a real economy with real money uh, that is completely kind of autonomous and, and works on its own. Um, another thing to think about is the data is that kind of some of the things we're doing is that when if you think about maybe if you made a game move, a transaction and that transaction can't be altered after the fact. So if you think of where we kind of think of what we have our own database and in our database, we are the admins of that database. I can go and hit delete. I can hide. I can alter that data. Well, in the blockchain, you can't do that. That's the whole point is to have this ledger that no one can touch and, and it's immutable. So it, thinking about this with games is that what if some of the or even all of the game moves are immutably stored in a ledger on a blockchain? And so maybe you could even start having community control around some of those things of your game. And so I'm going to kind of just hint, there's a lot more there, but this is really the, uh, I think what I want to focus on is about uh, smart contracts. Because this was really a kind of a big aha moment years ago when I started to really understand what they were. And I was actually exposed to this. There was actually uh, in Raleigh, there was a conference um, I forgot the name of it, but there, there was people talking about smart contracts there when everyone else was thinking about just the finance, being able to send payments back and forth. And they were saying, no, 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 smart contracts are the future. And here I am, you know, in the future talking about them today. So the, the core essence of that smart contract is that we can send, again, if you think of a check and you write, uh, you know, who it's to and you put your value or amount that you want to put on that check. And then the memo field, we can put data. Right. And so we send that check off and then that check can go to what we think, you know, traditionally a bank. But instead of a bank, it's a smart contract and a smart contract can say, OK, we take that data in. It could be a penny. It could be one hundred dollars. Doesn't matter. And then we look at your data and then we actually process that in a function so we can change or alter the data or create something new and output that out. And so your game could actually utilize that. Um, people, when they were first talking about smart contracts, about kind of autonomous voting systems where people would vote uh, with those transactions. And, and they could be, you know, under a penny just, just to get that data in there. Uh, or you could have, you know, things with your economy or marketplace. I mean, it's really the sky's the limit. You can even uh, string smart contracts together to where, you know, one function outputs to another function. And then it keeps going on and on and on. But the, from the high level view, this is kind of the really neat aspect is that you now have something that's kind of more out in the community. Think it's more open source, so to speak, than having it directly on your server. So there's, there's um, actually, a, when I think back to when I was first looking at this, there was a, um, 
a gambling game. There was, it was a dice game. And this was, you know, was, everything was new and Bitcoins were kind of like virtual currency. It, it wasn't $60,000. It was like maybe, I don't know, a couple bucks or something like that. So it was, it was like play money. And you could, um, they had these um, addresses that you could send to any amount that you wanted. And you could say, I want it to roll under this amount it's, or uh, I want 51% chance to win. And it would roll a random number and then see where it ended up. And if you won, it would send money back. So it's almost like you wrote a check, sent it off into the mail, and then it, was, it would do a random number. And if you won, you'd get a check back in the mail for you know, your money plus your profit. And that was a smart contract in, the, in a rudimentary form. So that was really, and this was years ago. And, and we've just innovated ever since in, in the industry as, as a whole. So um, when we think more about like, well, why, you know, I, I've, I've been dealing with this for years, you know, as we first started is why blockchain, you know, two years ago, I might've been why <laughs> myself, but now going through, there are some really cool things that can actually really innovate your game. And so I'm going to go through some of them here. Um, so one of the things that actually we are doing um, kind of goes down to game integrity. And I'm going to talk more about that later, but your multiplayer server can kind of be reinvented. It can be more transparent. Um, you could have game crossovers. You could have one game talk to another game. Maybe uh, something that's happening in one game can happen in another game based on what's what's going on uh, in one and in the other, like the weather. Uh, someone beats a boss and something changes in another game. And that uh, the blockchain is almost like the public database where they're reading from at that point. Um, obviously, I talked about the marketplaces. Uh, the transparency, um, you know, with what we're doing with crypto fights is that all moves are actually a financial transaction and those can be recorded. And so everyone can actually see what is happening and who's doing the moves. And I'll get more into this, but when you think about signing that check, you're also signing an identity as well with that. Now, game integrity is, a, is another big thing is that, you know, when we think about esports and competitive gaming, uh, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars in tournament prizes. Uh, I think that it's over a billion dollars. Uh, it's just rising more and more and more. You have like Fortnite. You do. I think. Uh, I think their last one was like a hundred million dollars uh, in total uh, on, on one year that they were doing prize money. So what happens? And this is a little bit kind of you know thinking really outside the box here but what if you're a game developer or, or an employee of this big game company where all of these online tournaments are running and you want to put maybe a 30 millisecond penalty on a player and you can go do that in your code or on your server or what if it's an ip address that you know and you want to ddos you know that player to penalize them so the integrity is that we can actually use the blockchain as the multiplayer server and kind of keep it more outside of the control of the game creator or the game developer. Um, and so that gives the kind of auditability that um, I think esports is going to need into the future. And there was actually just recently um, uh, uh, an article or a report, I should say, that the FBI is investigating a kind of a cons criminal conspiracy group in Counter Strike Go where they are like teams or players are throwing the matches while they have someone else bet uh, in the esports betting markets. So they would basically bet that they're going to lose so that they would essentially profit. And it's been going on for years and they're just getting caught. So blockchain kind of offers that because again, it's immutable. I, you know, I, if I control the game, I can't control the transaction. You know, the player does that. And so all of the, all of that game uh, data is essentially off limits to everyone. Um, but we can view it and we can read it. Um, you also have what's interesting is that when you think of that transaction that I talked about earlier, is that that's also payments. So you actually have a currency that can work anywhere in the world. That's the magic internet money thing coming back here. So you know we're we're in uh, you know Coinbase IPO territory where years and years ago you know it was kind of this maybe more of a novel thing. And now we're looking at, um, I think it's over a trillion dollars in market cap now. So cryptocurrency has really broken through. Um, institutional investors obviously are in it now. Private equity is looking at, I mean, there's, it's obviously going up. It's probably going to crash a little bit, but crypto has, has gone up and it's crashed and gone up higher after that. It really is a new invention that people are, it's like the internet in the 90s. It takes a while for the mass market to wrap their heads around this new technology. And it also takes an industry time to develop tools 
and infrastructure to be able to create the killer apps that will eventually come. So when you think about putting your game out into the market, you know, we have to use uh, distribution platforms like Steam, Google Play, iOS Store that have a payment cashier service, essentially, where they'll take, you know, credit cards or phone payments or, you know, whatever the country's popular payment method is and figure out how to, you know, obviously accept that payment and transfer it to you while they obviously take their cut. Well, with with. Bitcoin or I should say blockchain in general, you know, it's built into the network so where they can send you a payment at, you know, instantly. And now there's some exceptions now and I'm going to go into later about some of these blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum that are taking way too long right now. But you have a, essentially a global user base that um, can interact with your game or economy. Now, another thing I'm, I'm seeing actually in the blockchain industry is uh, play to earn. So instead of, you know, me going in and having a fun time with your game, you know, I want to be able to make some money with it. You know, I, I have, you know, time is money. I have Netflix. I have all these things distracting me. You know, what's to keep me in your game? You know, is it just entertainment value? Or what I'm seeing now is that there's actually where you can potentially profit by playing the, you know, that game. So some games are doing where, you know, they have to grind a lot in the game to maybe get a certain loot that could be considered valuable in the community. There's some games I'm seeing that are actually embedding um, um, actual tokens or cryptocurrency in puzzles. Um, so if you solve that really, really, really hard puzzle, you can get um, that cryptocurrency. And that could be there's actually one game where they have a million dollars embedded in the game and really, really hard puzzles. And so that's almost its own marketing in itself by having a a big treasure chest or, or pot of, of gold that people need to come and try to get out of. And meanwhile, your user base is going up. And so there, there's really cool ways that, um, or I should say new ways to market your game with putting incentives kind of directly into the game uh, using this. Because again, depending on what country you're from, you can't put a US dollar or a piece of cash inside of a digital game, but you can do that with blockchain. Now NFTs, which is you know the name of kind of the kind of the title here, NFTs have gotten so so hot lately. Um, when we were first starting this, everyone was doing NFTs, but nobody cared. And we actually said, you know what, NFTs are cool, but we wanted to really figure out kind of a new backend technology on how to actually uh, uh, kind of propel past NFTs. Um, but I'll say that we've actually are about to release our marketplace for NFTs because all of our game items, all of our characters, everything is an NFT. All an NFT means is non-fungible token. It means something that can't be divided. You know, I was telling Dan before here is that if you think of a, a piece of art, right, and it's scarce, maybe there's only so many copies the artist made, and that is tokenized, so it's kind of like that coin with data attached to it, and then people can you know freely trade it, or they can put it in their purse or their, or their Bitcoin wallet and hold on to it, and that's what's happening right now is that there is um, kind of these incredible um, um, companies that I'm going to go into a little bit later that are doing crazy amounts of money with NFTs and and uh, doing license deals with certain IP like NBA and uh, I think they have some entertainment companies come in and even actors. So there's um, the ability to create kind of an economy um, with that itself. So if you think of maybe a Star Wars game that had Star Wars characters and Star Wars lightsabers and weapons and stormtroopers and all that, and they were actually ownable by you and you could collect them. And it's the same thing with you know the collectible market in, in a whole, but it's just in a digital format. So um, there's a lot more there, but those are, I think, one of the top ones that I would say that uh, for the why on the blockchain gaming. So when we got started, um, when I was kind of remembering back into 2017, when I was kind of looking at Ethereum, um, Ethereum was, you know, kind of brand new. Uh, it was kind of the, I would say the, probably the leader in the smart contract uh, area, but um, there was these new uh, projects being developed um, and there actually was blockchain games and they were very, very simple at first that were starting back there, but I started to kind of look at this and I started watching uh, Vitalik, which was kind of the co-creator of Ethereum, about how you know you can kind of code and, and create programs or applications out on, on, on the blockchain and that decentralized aspect to where you could have almost like an organism that is working for you 24 seven and never gives up, um, kind of really caught my attention. And I, I started putting uh, together a small team to start thinking about how we could create these games. 
Um, you know, again, back then, most of the games I think were centered around kind of NFTs in the sense that um, you would be purchasing game items and you were kind of speculating that they would go up in value or um, some of them were kind of Ponzi-ish where you had to kind of be the first in uh, because the, the later people would have would be less likely to make money off of it. I mean, it was it was a very Wild West kind of environment. Um, and another thing to point out is that most of the games were web applications and, and not to discredit like HTML5 and all that uh, type games, but they, they're they not what I typically think of with using like actual 3D engines like Unreal or Unity. Um, and so they were, they were kind of doing, um, you know, very simple animations, um, you know, simple sounds. And you had to use um, kind of like a browser plugin uh, back then that you would kind of interface with that. But, you know, as these new kind of industries uh, kind of start growing, I mean, the, you have the dot-com bubble that we've gone through. We've had, I remember when the app stores came out, um, you know, and maybe we're in the blockchain bubble now, but, you know, they've all gotten bigger anyways. You know, the app stores are huge now. It's saturated. It's, it's kind of hard to stand out on the app stores. Um, you know, the blockchain is, is, we've been thinking about, you know, blockchain is, is this much per coin. Um, but we're really, I think, just getting started to start thinking about blockchain as a technology because we're starting to see more and more applications. We're seeing more investment funds uh, looking into it uh, because of the kind of early successes. And I'm actually going to um, I'm going to talk about one of those in a, in a, in a bit. But um, this is kind of another example about um, this is actually a more recent screenshot of a uh, kind of a, a DAP ranking, what they call uh, you know application ranking. And I just looked at games here. And um, the daily active users was kind of the reason why I was kind of really skeptical of this whole thing actually several years ago is that it was very, very hard to interact with this for a layperson. And what I mean by that is, you know, A, you had to have cryptocurrency and several years ago, it was like pretty much Coinbase or nothing, you know, and you had to go and have an account on there with Coinbase, you had to purchase the currency, and then they had to kind of do, uh, know your customer, load your ID, wait for a bank transfer, because I don't think uh, credit cards worked back then. And then you had to wait several days to get those coins, and then you could use it on maybe that game you wanted to, to experiment with. So it was just horrible. And then when you actually did have the coins, you would have to install a plugin kind of like MetaMask. And MetaMask was a browser plugin like Chrome, and that was to transfer the coins to there and then you would have to interact and some of those early games made you kind of approve these transactions as they happen because it was a financial transaction at the time and uh, so like a decision in the game would be a transaction that you say do you do you authorize this yes do you authorize this yes so it was it was a really bad ux back then but as you can see this is actually a more recent screenshot of the daily active user accounts there's a reason why this has gone down and i'm gonna get to in a bit but the, the cool thing is that the, these users are actually big, big spenders um, because they, they kind of have this virtual currency that is worth a lot of money, but they don't think of it that way. And then they kind of use your application and they can do things. Um, I think on here, the, the Litecoin one, uh, no, not that one. The, I'm sorry, the Wax one, they have like 100,000 users. So they're one of the bigger ones, but it's <clears throat> in terms of gameplay, I, I don't think it's very a very compelling game. It's, it's kind of like an economy game, um, but not, not a, I don't think a ton of like entertainment value. <clears throat> now, Ethereum was typically the leader in, in this. And several years ago, they were, and I don't think they're uh, as a leader now because of the problems that they're having. But they still are, I mean, they're going up, I think, 10, 20% today. I was looking earlier. Um, it's a huge market cap blockchain. Um, so there's a lot of people that hold it. But, you know, the, the big thing here is that it, it wasn't very pretty back then, um, but it, it's definitely gotten a lot better. Um, so as this was happening back then, they, you know, there's this new community being formed uh, with decent, decentralized applications. And this wasn't just gaming. There was uh, a thing called DeFi, and that meant decentralized finance. So if you had, um, you could actually loan out your coins and earn an interest rate. And that's actually pretty big now. But before it was like experimental. Um, you had... Um, exchanges like you could exchange your your bitcoin for ethereum and it would be completely in the in, involved in those smart contracts so it could never be shut down you know even i mean it was it just existed on the blockchain 
um, you had um, kind of that that whole idea about being kind of this organism is that they started creating all these different applications. There's you know gambling applications where, um, like I mentioned, you could send a transaction and it would do a random number and you'd get some money back. You had um, even more kind of advanced things where they had essentially full blown casinos out there, um, and anyone in the world could interact with it. Um, you know, you had. Um, they, they even had what I mentioned before is like decentralized autonomous organizations. So they actually had organizations that would have votes and you could vote on what it did and, and they'd have other applications under that. So it was almost like this entire organization uh, that was like doing business and, and it was completely out on the blockchain with anonymous voters and stuff like that. Um, and so this was really, it kind of felt like the early internet to me is that we're doing all these experimentations and we're trying to see kind of what's working, but um, they were really interesting. Um, and on this chart right here, you can kind of see this is uh, kind of a, a really long view is that probably late last year and this year, crypto has gone absolutely bonkers. Um, there's more and more people that are getting wallets. There are more and more people that are you know, like when you think of Bitcoin several years ago, oh, that's a scam. You know, that that's just, they're just pumping and dumping. You know, now they're saying, like, you know, maybe there's something there. And people are getting more and more comfortable with it. People are maybe invest, and believe it or not, people are, uh, there's big funds that like retirement funds that are investing uh, a little bit into crypto because of the appreciation that it has. Um, and, you know, it's just yield seeking, but it's starting to become more and more comfortable on kind of the financial side. And that's going to unlock, if you think about PayPal, is that PayPal had to keep growing. And the more and more and then the network effect happened. And then when, you know, hundreds of millions of people had PayPal accounts, then it became very easy to buy on the Internet. <clears throat> so this was a game that I remember very well. Um, I did. I absolutely hated it. But it was probably the inflection point for the blockchain gaming industry. Uh as you can see here, there was a um, an article, and this is actually when it caught my attention. This is late 2017, kind of how I got into this, is that th this game was uh, kind of a collectible game where you would have a cat, so you would purchase a cat, and then you would breed that cat, and the DNA would change, and then you would kind of output a new cat, and that picture would kind of change with those genetic traits. And those pictures of cats would be sold in a marketplace. And because other people wanted those pictures of cats, or I should say the DNA of those cats, so they could breed and make kind of better cats. And so believe it or not, this game actually brought down the Ethereum network because of the volume, the sheer volume that was done on this game. Um, you know, as you can see here, like there's been uh, six figure trades of, of these kitties, crypto kitties. Um, you know, the average price they're saying is about 60, $65, I think when I last looked. Um, but the so this is a really interesting thing when like so i laugh now and i and i kind of laugh then but the company that actually started this it was an experiment and so this was the start of nfts and they ended up becoming dapper labs and dapper labs created nba top shot they did a license deal from the nba and they got these kind of notable moments um videos stuff like that or, or players and they made an NFT uh, on their own blockchain uh, called Flow that um, people could buy and collect. But they're doing very, very well right now. They just raised $305 million at a $2.3 billion pre-money valuation. So they're doing so much business that investors are valuing them as a multi-billion dollar company in a matter of a couple of years. So, NFTs maybe are crazy right now and probably going to come down. I think there's a lot more innovation coming with NFTs. But as you can see, like when they created this game back then as an experiment, they were very successful at that point. But they ended up becoming, you know, uh, Dapper Labs and, and doing just wildly successful things by putting kind of uh, a popular brand on an NFT platform. So um, again, I didn't like the game, but it, it just shows you that the the kind of the pioneers are the ones that are kind of blazing the trail and, and trying these new things and trying to innovate uh, the space. And I think it will innovate gaming uh, in the future. Now, when we go kind of more into the blockchains, like there's all these different blockchains. And so if you are going to develop 
uh, a blockchain game, you have to be very careful of the blockchain that you're going to pick. Now, this was way more important probably years ago, and it's I think it's still greatly important now because there's way more choices now. You you know, several years ago there wasn't as many I think truly viable projects. Um, Ethereum was really the top project um, for development. And that has changed. And there's a lot of other ones. I don't even keep up with all of them. There's so many. Um, but, you know, when we started on Ethereum, you know, back in really 2018, early 2018, and um, it, it worked. It worked back then. Now it doesn't because it's not scaling. Um, if, if you look at this chart, though, you know, just in terms of the volume of money passing through these blockchains, you know, maybe around two billion. And now it's like 10 to 12 billion dollars uh, like a month. I mean, I mean, even the market cap, if you actually look at the activity traded, I mean, it's really hard to kind of discern what someone's sending a payment, what someone, you know, just transferring money to their other wallet and what's, you know, viable economic activity around some kind of business. But um, you know, I, I still think we're in the very early stages of all of this, you know, NFTs, blockchains, blockchain gaming. It's so, so early right now. And, um, the, I do think the, I hope not, and I hope it's not for a while, but I do think the government will come in and start to regulate. I mean, I think they're way off now. I mean, they're still wrapping their heads around just the payment system itself. Um, but when we think about like NFTs and all that stuff where people can, you know, have a, maybe a piece of art that's $100 million and, and have it uh, in a seed phrase, which is like 12 words that they can remember and hop on a plane and go somewhere else and put into their wallet there and, and sell it. And, and I mean, it's like the possibilities are endless with stuff that the government doesn't like. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of Ponzi schemes that people made money and, and they're probably still up and people maybe are still using it. And it's just, it's very, very wild west, but, um, as adoption, I think, happens later on, I think it'll be harder and harder to kind of get away with, I think, what I've seen years ago, uh, especially. Now, the um, – so I'm, gonna, I'm just looking at these top two, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum right now. There's a whole lot more, and they probably have a whole lot more um, advantages and disadvantages. But this is kind of considered the the top – uh, blockchains in the, I think the mass market, well, I should say most of the market's mine right now. And so <clears throat> Bitcoin, and I'm going to actually start saying Bitcoin core because they were the kind of the first, right? And they can only do about 311,000 tra uh, transactions per day. All right. So what happened, right? The narrative and the story back when I was getting to this is that this was going to be the payment system that the world was going to use. The whole world was going to use Bitcoin. And now it's a digital store of gold. So they've changed from magic internet money to it's, it's digital gold. So there's something, something happened. And I'm going to actually go into that. Ethereum, kind of the same thing. It was modeled after Bitcoin. They do, they're doing better at 1.4 million transactions a day. But it's still like, for example, Visa can do 150 million transactions a day, which is about 1,700 transactions per second. So they can't even rival Visa. So I can't imagine that these blockchains are going to be where you buy a cup of coffee. And this is why. Now, I actually looked at this. These are actually outdated because uh, this was like, I think, a week ago. Um, the So when you send a transaction on Bitcoin, you have to pay a transaction fee. And that transaction fee is what the miners that secure the network do to basically stay in business and, and to maybe churn a little bit of a profit. And so as the scalability issues uh, happen with these blockchains, people are essentially forced to increase the amount of, of a fee to send that transaction. So think of it like a little bucket, right? Bitcoin has this one or two megabyte bucket that can fit transactions, right? And because of the demand of I want to get this transaction into the next block, is that I have to well, say, well, there's only so much space in this bucket and say, well, I have to raise my transaction fee, you know, take me, take me, take me. And so people are up in those transaction fees. So I actually just looked this morning, Bitcoin actually right now is $58.44 for an average transaction fee. Ethereum actually went up a little bit to $23.05. All right. So the whole thing about you can go buy a cup of coffee, all this kind of stuff isn't happening. <laughs> no more microtransactions are, are allowed. 
uh, because of that. They've essentially created a floor. Even if it if a transaction was double that, are you going to spend fifty percent of that transaction for as a fee to do? You know, so it's broken. I mean, that's kind of my main point is that it broke. Um, and again, it goes back to why is, is, is kind of the block size. This is kind of a controversial thing, but the philosophy of these blockchains crippled it. You know, Bitcoin's philosophy, or the, I should say the developer's philosophy, and there's a lot of controversy around this and all that, was that if we keep increasing the block size, then people couldn't be running a node or be a miner by running their Raspberry Pi at home. And it would make everything really centralized. So only the really big, you know, people that have a lot of hundreds of millions of dollars would be the miners. Well, guess what? Even with their philosophy, most of the mining happens in China right now. So I, I, I hate to be the dead horse, but you know, we when we started on Ethereum, we started kind of seeing the writing on the wall. Is that we we can't operate with this kind of with these kind of issues. And so this is why we moved to what uh, Bitcoin SV. So it's actually a fork off of Bitcoin. And their main kind of thesis is to scale and to not limit the block size. And if you see here, <clears throat> um, they have a, a test network. It's kind of like the staging area where they can kind of test these things with test BSV or test Bitcoin. And if you lose it and you screw up, it, no big deal. You can get more of it. Um, but they did 9,000 transactions per second. So they beat Visa. Um, the block sizes they're doing, uh, even the last 24 hours, they did over a gig while Bitcoin core, that's, you know, $60,000 or almost $60,000 now, depending on where it is now today is only doing like two megabytes. And then you have, you know, uh, multi gigabyte blocks They are They want to get into the terabyte size blocks. They want to be the global commodity ledger of the world. And so we actually ended up having to, well, we moved over to BSV for short. Uh, with our game and our whole platform that I'm going to get into. But the reason why is because if we didn't, we would have been crippled because of Ethereum. And that's what the big deal was, is that when I showed you the daily active users on that, who is going to play your game or interface with your game when simply to even get into that game, like to transfer, uh, you know, some Bitcoin into your game costs 20 to $50. So if you want to put a dollar into it, sorry, doesn't make sense. So, Picking your blockchain very wisely can make a lot of difference because a lot of these scaling issues won't, or any kind of issue won't become apparent until it's actually in use, uh, like by the, by, the, by the public essentially. So, so I'm gonna get into kind of more of what we're building. And so, you know, we have, uh, like I said, we started with the game Crypto Fights and by doing that and kind of going through all this trial and error and, and hitting, you know, the, the roadblocks with Ethereum and trying to create new tools and, finding BSV and then kind of retooling over there and thinking in a whole new way, you know, Ethereum development to Bitcoin uh, SV development is very different and very, you have to think about it very differently, um, is that we started to see that, you know, there's a lot of potential with um, eSports and eSports has a lot of obviously a co competitive gaming experience for people. Um, and so we thought, you know, Esports right now, I mean, I don't want to get into it. It's not really about that, but it's very fragmented and it's kind of going off the, the legacy sports motto where, you know, let's have teams, let's play in venues and, and you know, kind of the game, uh, the game company or game publisher kind of owns the rights and they kind of control everything and all that. I see it very differently. I see it more, maybe more like uh, online poker is that I should be able to go into a game and, um, you know, play for money. And when I'm done, I can go and eat dinner and, and live a normal life. Like I don't have to become a pro athlete level gamer to be able to get into esports or, or to make money off of that. And so we actually started thinking about that and took that to heart and, and creating a whole platform that's essentially dedicating itself to competitive gaming. Um, and so that means, you know, we're having cash tournaments, NFT marketplace, and we're going to get into like a data explorer because of that game integrity, uh, tournament leaderboards, match replays, profiles, wallets, all that stuff. And I'm going to start going through that right now. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of our um, NFT marketplace that we're building on Bitcoin SV. And there's some big differences with the, uh, with what we're, well, there's, there's differences in how we do it versus some other places that you might've heard of, like that are based on Ethereum or maybe on some other blockchain. Um, so if I actually want to do a transaction now on BSV for, doesn't matter the amount, it's like micro cents. I mean, it's like a one hundredth of a cent to do a transaction and it's instant. I mean, it's, it's like, bam, right in your wallet and it works right away. And so when we have game items in our game crypto fights, you know, and we do a loot drop 
it's in your it's in their wallet and so they can then pop over to our portal and say you know what i don't think i want this anymore maybe i want to melt it and which means destroy it and take the value out of it maybe i want to list it for sale uh, maybe you know i i want to send it to my friend you know and, and do a transfer and so that has to be cheap and it has to be fast because that's what we expect as gamers right so this this nft marketplace um also you know so let's think if we have a character and that character, you know, is a 3D models, the textures, um, the maybe a sound files, uh, you know, we can store all of that on chain to where that you actually, when you actually transfer it, all of that goes with it. So it's not stored on our server somewhere. It's actually stored on the blockchain to where it'll exist uh, permanently that way. So it, it'll remain after we're gone. Um, another thing uh, that could be cool and actually I think we're going to do is that we can actually have loot drops maybe like a treasure chest that's maybe very rare, but it has a hundred dollars worth of BSV in it. And so the incentive to grind in your game or to play it or to, or to uh, explore your game is very high. And that goes back to what I was saying about why blockchain gaming. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff that these NFT marketplaces can add. Now, here's just another screen kind of going in there is that when you create it, you can, uh, we can use many different types of files. Um, mp3s you know like if a musical artist wants to uh sell a song and i mean this is a little bit outside of gaming at this point but um if if it's a song and then they want to have like a video showing the, the behind the scenes creation of the song and them you know figuring out the notes and then maybe the lyrics and a sign autograph i mean they can all attach that into an nft and actually sell it on a marketplace and what we want to actually venture into is where there actually is licensing rights. So like when you own it, maybe you, sh you can't commercialize it for sale, but you can maybe sell it just like if you did, if you owned a physical game, which isn't what happens anymore. But NFTs are kind of bringing back the physical ownership of things. And I think there is going to be incredible potential as this kind of innovates in the, in the industry to uh, with the gaming industry, but as well as the entertainment industry. And like I said, there's a lot of people doing very well with kind of the hype right now with architects making uh, like houses that, it, you know, are digital houses and people are trading it and all that. Um, and then one of the other things that I, I mentioned is that you can actually put a floor value on the item. So let's say it's a picture of your cat. Nobody cares about your cat. But what if you put $1,000 in that NFT plus the picture of your cat? Well, now it's a thousand dollar cat and people might say, you know what? I'm willing to pay a thousand dollars and one or a thousand one dollars for that NFT. And now you have a market. So um, you can. So what we call that backing is that we can back an NFT with an amount of BSV, which is essentially equivalent to how much cash you want to um, kind of intrinsically put into that. <clears throat> Here's another uh, quick screenshot of when you want to create an NFT. Very simple. You just name it, preview image, attach all the files that you want into it put a description, uh, search tags, how much you want to back it with, and then how many uh, of those items do you want to create. So if you just want to do one or if you want to do a thousand, you could create and then you could then release that as part of your game. Like so a, a, a trading card pack or it could be a character um, that only maybe a thousand will ever be created. Um, maybe you have a license deal with with John Romero or something and, and you want to make a, a, a character um, that only he exists and only a thousand people will ever own his character and, and they could go from game to game to game like in uh, Ready Player One. Well, you can do that. Um, so this is just a screen to kind of show you is that we're we're hopefully uh, going to be launching this uh, in early May. Um, so you can check it out. Um, and here's just another quick screenshot of showing, um, you know, that you can, uh, once you own these items, you can melt them, you can transfer them very easy. Um, it's, it's some of the other marketplaces because of those transaction fees make this very, very difficult. And ours will be very cheap. Now, the other thing with uh, competitive gaming is is having the ability to do a tournament system. And in tournaments, we want to do like cash tournaments where anyone can enter, and um, it's be able to have profit. I mean, it could be a one versus one. It could be uh, like a one versus ten. It, you know, king of the hill, single elimination. It could be like a team death match. Whatever you want, you should be able to have like an entry fee where people can compete and then the winner takes all, maybe minus a, a small fee for the tournament uh, operator. And this is essentially the basis, I think, for esports is that it's the kind of the top level play. It's like you're playing for money. It's, it's, it's high adrenaline, you know, high stakes kind of thing. <clears throat> now, 
this I think is the most incredible, one of the most incredible things about blockchain gaming that we have discovered is that in our game crypto fights is that when you make a move, it is a financial transaction that is stored in the blockchain and it's in a ledger. Well, what if you could basically, so we're storing the data of everything that ever happened in a game, right? So you could actually read that data back through a game engine and that game engine could recreate that game. And now I know of, I think Dota 2, which is a, a MOBA, that um, you can save a file of the game that you just played and you can store that. And then if you just put it back in there, it completely recreates the game. It's deterministic. So we have a permanent time capsule of everything that ever happened inside of your blockchain game. And so we can actually, what we've already done is create a rendering engine that um, is in the cloud that will take in that data, render the game back and produce the video. And so if you think of Twitch, Twitch has nothing on us because they only store the video, we store the data of the game. And so we can recreate this, we can create content on top of content, so commentators, training sessions, whatever it is, we can kind of do that um, on demand, you know, just with a rendering engine. So I also mentioned, you know, everything is, uh, is essentially a transaction, so we have a data explorer where you can actually go in there and look at everything that everyone ever did, and you could drill down into a match, into the essentially the combat log uh, of that competitive match and, and find out everything you want, even the profile of that person and go and look at that, uh, everything that that person did. So it's like, it's almost like a social media of, of gaming at that point. Um, also we have, uh, so this smart cashier with the global currency support. So we're actually gonna have um, where we wanna be able to take uh, any type of cryptocurrency that is out there and convert it into our native currency on our platform of BSV. And we also are going to have where um, a fiat bridge where you can use your credit card, uh, Apple Pay, and things like that to if you want to use that to basically buy BSV and use it in our system. But we can't touch your BSV. You actually have a wallet in our platform that we are not custodians of, meaning that we can't take it away from you. We can't cut off your funds. Like we can't take your money, you know? And so that's kind of the cool thing about blockchain is that you are your own bank at that point. So here's a quick screenshot of when we first started. We were uh, running on a shoestring budget. I actually bootstrapped uh, the game when we first started. And we were using a lot of uh, kind of pre-made stock assets. And, you know, and this is when we were on Ethereum. We were really trying to figure out how do we do this on the back end. And then all these kind of problems started happening. And, and so it, these are some of the early screenshots that I dug up that um, – and now we look like this. Uh, we, we've had uh, several years and some funding to actually improve dramatically the game. Um, and, you know, we've been able to hire some artists and, and really get in there and, and also think through, a lot, uh, you know, about a lot of this, like the game balancing and, and how all this is going to work to actually make a real good game that, that um, can stand up to some of the other, uh, I wouldn't say AAA, but, you know, maybe A or AA games, um, you know, out there. Um, and so if Dan, can you actually uh, start that trailer? Let's see, he's getting that going. Yeah, sure thing. I can get that trailer going. Um, here we go. Let's add it.
You know, people just love to put me in their games. <laughs> <laughs> Can you switch back to the uh, to the slides? I got one more, and I want to end. Is that anyone that watched the trailer? You know, we are in open beta now, and you can go and download and play. We are on testnet right now so um it's not for money yet and and all the items are going to get wiped and all that but you can kind of test it out and that's actually working on a a blockchain test net right now um and we'd love your feedback from especially the community here um and so i just had some final thoughts about the kind of the future um what's gonna maybe what's gonna happen and i think it's it's a really exciting time to be a gamer right now um i think that like when i was growing up you know being a little kid with games and and my parents thought of games as kind of a waste of time um and then i think back to all of the games that really challenged me um they made me much smarter i think because of that they they challenged you know my intellect they made you solve uh like i mean miss for example anybody remember that how hard that was i mean solving some of these games whether it's a physics based game or um, you had to have lateral thinking skills, you know, to be able to, to, to solve that game is incredibly valuable. I think, especially when I grew up and, and maybe the game developers that are here is that you actually challenge, you know, people and how they operate. But when we start to think about with blockchain is that we can actually maybe, um, you know, put that profit in for them is that, you know, being a gamer could, you know, maybe that's the future. Well, we, duh, it's probably the future of education. Um, and just the innovation in the space, I think is going to be great. And a lot of, uh, I think the inspiration about where we started and where we want to go is probably ready player one is that the metaverse, I really do think is possible with blockchain. I, uh, people use that word very loosely now, um, in our industry. And I, I kind of think of it as that we really need a protocol the same way that we use HTTP. IP addresses, everything. There has to be a real protocol where games can coexist, interact with each other, facilitate payments, have built-in license agreements, and have you know a character from one game or an NFT go from one game to another without having to use tr the traditional legacy kind of cl cloud server system to where there's no centralized authority um, that can stop it. You know, like we, I have to be able to own my items and I have to be able to go from a game to a, to a new game. And I think that the missing key here is that there needs to be a, a kind of a standard protocol for games to do that. Um, so if you think back to those NFT items, the metadata and the properties of how it works would be kind of the, the code that um, another game could utilize. So maybe the NFT works a little bit differently in a different game. So here's an example of how I think about it is right. If I have a race car game and I'm driving through and I'm kind of looking around and then I look up and I see helicopters above me, right? Well, the game I'm in is really only existing as a race car game, but the helicopters above me is happening on another part of the blockchain. But the game, the race car game can view that if it wants to, or it can hide it if it wants to. So it can choose to interact with that and say, maybe the helicopters are going to crash into the track and cause a, a wreck. And so that interactivity can be really, really cool, you know, where you maybe have kind of an MMO where, you know, the, the sea part of it is a naval game and maybe the air part of it is a flying game and the land part of it is an adventure game. I mean, who knows? The sky's the limit. But I think we're we're not even on the cusp yet. I think we're very early, but it's it's going to happen. I think over the next decade, um, and so I'll end it with that. I, I do want to take some questions because I'm kind of running a little late here, um, so I'd, I'd be happy to answer some questions from the audience. All right, let's drop some questions for you, um, do, 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 do. Adam. Do you have a way? to store game mods on blockchain? Great question. So this was actually something that we thought about is that, you know, the modding community is, has created some of the best games, right? I mean, even some of the big MOBAs, um, you know, like Dota 2 uh, was, was a great example of that. It was kind of like a modding or I remember like Half-Life and extending the game's life because of the modding community. And so with blockchain games, like, so we could, we could say, well, let's start a cool game. And so actually what we're doing with CryptoFights is that, the um the way like the game rules and the game mechanics are actually stored on chain and so what that means is that well our game kind of utilizes these functions that exist out on the blockchain but let's say you want to take those same characters but the game rules are a little different maybe you want to make 
I don't know, uh, uh, an adventure game or a boxing game with the same characters. And, and there's maybe some pieces of that game that you want to keep, but you really want to kind of recreate the experience. Well, we can actually embed, you know, maybe you pay us like one thousandth of a cent every time a player does something that utilizes parts of our game. And it's built into that smart contract or that function. And, you know, either you uh, as the game creator can facilitate that micro transaction or the actual user that's doing it could facilitate that microtransaction. And so the modding community is going to love this stuff because I think as this goes on, I mean, there's there's games like that are more sandboxy types of games that are trying to create uh, user generated content. And so I, I, there's still a little siloed in my opinion, but I think the true metaverse and what the, the modding community can do is, is like changing out the models. Like maybe an artist wants to make uh, like, like if we think of um, like Morrowind or something where they, they do like, you know, better textures or better images or, you know, just something better and different um, as they can kind of mod that game with without kind of getting into the code, so to speak. So I think that's a great question. I think it's definitely something to watch over the years. OK, and we have enough time for one more quick question. And then after that, you can jump into the discord. So here we go. What's the advantage of using blockchain technology for ownable game items over having a game server that only lets a limited limited number of instances right. exist. Proof. So the the way that when you say like having a game server that only lets a limited number of instances, so prove it. Prove that you can't alter that when you change your mind. Prove that you can't delete something. And so that's the kind of the the, the question you have to ask yourself is about, is about why blockchain is almost it restricts the ability. It's not centralized in that aspect. Is that when you create an item on the blockchain, it, it, it it's left your control, right? And so if, if you create an item, NFT, whatever, and you transfer it to me, and, and it's like, for example, using the what we're creating, we can't go and claw it back. We can't go and change it. We can't go and, and mint, you know, a thousand more because people will know. People will know that things have changed. And so it's, it's provable scarcity, provable ownership. Um, you, you can't cheat the blockchain. If you could, then someone would be a trillionaire right now. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's really decentralized authority. I guess, I, I don't know how, it, hopefully that makes sense, but it, that's why things are becoming valuable is because they, they exist kind of outside of the control of, of the creator. Oh, Dan, you're muted. <laughs> that is good stuff and if you have more questions for adam adam join us on the discord discord.gg slash indie game business there is a channel over there post chat post session chat you can jump in there and um ask adam all of these questions more about blockchain thank you so much for coming on here we have another guest coming right up we appreciate your time and i am actually really excited to check out crypto fights cool so, appreciate it Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.